We started running these clinics last summer as a substitute for our face-to-face -face, um, uh, roadshows that we had uh, become used to doing um, and which of course had to stop because of COVID. But we've now uh, realized that these are in fact incredibly valuable and very useful sessions. Um, and I'm sure that we will keep them going long after COVID is a hopefully distant memory. So um, welcome tonight. We have nearly 90 people on the call at the moment and it's very good that you are able to join us. Um, I'm very grateful to all the world-class clinicians and scientists, researchers who are willing to give their time to take part in these sessions. Um, if you have a question this evening uh, for our guest speaker, please use the chat function to, uh, uh, to alert me and I'll get round to your question um, uh, uh, after we've heard our speaker this evening. Um, our topic tonight is genetics. Genetics, the element of this uh, macular disease that really is implicated in whether or not we develop this condition. Um, macular disease, age-related macular disease is a complex condition, a combination of genetic factors and so-called environmental factors. But tonight we're going to focus on the genetics of AMD. And I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce my guest tonight, who is Dr. Alistair Warwick. Now, Alistair is a specialist registrar ophthalmologist training in London. He's in Wimbledon. And um, he began his journey into AMD genetic research, though, with um, an old friend of ours and somebody you may have uh, seen on a previous um, virtual clinic, Professor Andrew Lotry, uh, who uh, is part of the uh, ophthalmology team at Southampton University Hospitals Trust in Hampshire. Currently, Alistair is taking time out of clinical practice to complete a PhD at uh, University College London, UCL and Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is exploring the genetic epidemiology of common retinal diseases such as AMD. And he's going to talk to us this evening about his work. So Alistair, a very warm welcome to the virtual clinic. I'm gonna hand over to you for what I'm sure is going to be a fabulous talk. And, um, and then we'll come back to you for some questions in a moment. Alistair Warwick, ladies and gentlemen. That's great. Um, thank you very much, Cathy. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. It's um, a real pleasure to be talking to you this evening. Um, just a little note, there will be some slides on your screen, but I will also be talking through all this information. So um, please do look away and simply listen if you prefer. Now I'm just going to um, set that up. So let's get this. I'm going to turn off my video for a bit. Um, so it's just a bit less distracting. Okay. Um, Okay, and Kathy, that's showing okay? You can still hear me? I can, yes, perfect, thank you. Great. Okay, um, so as you may have gathered from the title, I'll be talking about age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, genetics, and the two together, genetic research in AMD. Um, and what I really like is to give you a flavor for how genetic research can benefit all of us. You know, why should we be interested in genetics? Um, and then we can fill in any gaps in the questions and, and hopefully talk a little bit more about any PhD work I'm doing or, or other, other topics. Um, so why should we be interested in genetics? Hold on to that thought, and I'm gonna to return to it in just a couple of minutes after I've introduced AMD. So for those of us who are less familiar with um, age-related macular degeneration, AMD is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world, affecting one in 20 people over the age of 75. Signs typically only appear after the age of 60, and visual decline tends to be slow. AMD affects the macula, and this is a specialized part of the retina at the back of our eye, responsible for our fine central vision. So reading books, seeing colors, recognizing faces, these abilities all rely on a healthy macula. The hallmark sign of um, early macular degeneration is drusen. And this is buildups of waste material, um, which look like yellowy dots at the macula. Vision is usually good at this stage, but things can progress to more advanced AMD. Advanced AMD has two main forms, wet, and dry. In the wet form, 
there is fluid leakage and bleeding at the macula. Fortunately, we can now treat this quite effectively with medications that are delivered into the eye. In the advanced um, form of dry AMD, also called geographic atrophy, there's gradual loss of the light sensing cells at the macula. They're simply no longer there to see with. But unlike West AMD, we currently don't have a treatment for geographic atrophy. Having said that, there are some very promising potential new treatments on the horizon. In particular, clinical trials for the drugs Zimura and APL2 both very recently showed a significant decrease in geographic atrophy growth by over 25%. Now for a, a more complete list of current drug trials in dry AMD, uh, please do go to the website and have a listen to Dr. Claire Bailey's brilliant talk in this series. But I've picked these two examples out, um, well, because their results are particularly encouraging, but also because both of these drugs target the complement pathway. Now, the complement pathway is one of the older components of our immune systems and is essentially an inflammatory pathway. So why then have drug developers chosen to target complement specifically? Well, this is in large part thanks to the insights gained from genetic research. So returning to that thought I asked you to hold on to earlier, how can we benefit from genetic research? Well, for a start, it can help us to accelerate drug development. Complement and AMD is a strong example of this. And the story of complement and AMD genetics, you know, how we got to where we are today from the completion of the Human Genome Project back in 2003, is really quite amazing. By sharing this with you, I hope you'll come away with this uh, from this talk with a, a clearer idea of what genetic research is and how it can actually lead to new drugs. I will also touch on some other ways in which genetic information is being applied, Mendelian randomization, predictive medicine, and pharmacogenetics. Then to finish, I'll say a little about where the field is moving. To start though, I should spend a few minutes reviewing some important ideas in genetics. Each of the cells in our body contains a chemical code called DNA, and this is composed of four letters, A, T, C, and G. The complete code consists of three billion of these letters, and this is referred to as our genome. If you visit the Wellcome Collection Museum in London, you can actually find a copy of a complete human genome from the Human Genome Project. So that's all three billion letters printed. You'd find a bookcase of many books. And if you open one of these books, you'll find it's filled with many, many pages of A's, T's, C's, and G's. This is the complete instruction manual for how our bodies work. Now about 5% of the lines on these pages represents genes of which we have about 20,000. These are fragments of DNA code that get translated into proteins, the building blocks of our bodies. So the white of your eye, the chemical compound that captures light in the retina, or your antibodies that fight infections, these are all proteins. Now, what happens if um, you open one of these books and say page 10, line 20, I have a T and you have an A? Well, spelling differences between individuals, called genetic variants, are common and often have no noticeable effect. However, some of these do cause subtle alterations in protein function, and this could explain why, for example, some of us are more likely to develop AMD than others. More rarely, a spelling mistake can have significant detrimental consequences. For instance, if it means that an important protein doesn't get produced properly. An example of this in ophthalmology is choroideremia. This is a rare inherited eye condition that causes early loss of sight. For conditions like this, caused by a single faulty gene, gene therapy is showing really positive results. With gene therapy, as the name suggests, genetic material is the medicine. So in, say, choroideremia, a normal copy of the gene can be inserted into the patient's cells 
to produce the missing protein. The first gene therapy trial for choroideremia began in Oxford in 2011. And this showed that even after some years, the treatment not only halts the disease, but could in some cases actually improve vision. But AMD is very different. There's no single gene that causes AMD, but rather small effects from multiple genes in combination with lifestyle factors such as diet or smoking influence an individual's risk of developing it. So this means we can't use gene therapy to simply fix a single faulty gene. As I mentioned though, certain genetic variants may have subtle effects that influence an individual's risk of developing AMD. So if someone has a quote, risky version of a gene, that doesn't mean they will definitely get AMD, but they are more likely to do so than someone with a less risky version of that gene. So if we, if we identify which genes influence AMD risk, how does that help us? Well, we can study what that gene does. What protein does it produce? And knowing that we might then be able to produce a drug that targets this. So more work is needed after that genetic discovery, but at least this provides us with a starting point and it narrows down the options quite a bit from the 20,000 genes that we started with. So let's recap. Um, our genome is the complete set of DNA code that makes us who we are. This contains 20,000 genes, bits of DNA that get translated into proteins, which are the building blocks of our bodies. And spelling differences in our DNA, called genetic variants, may affect how some of those protein work, making us either more or perhaps less likely to develop a disease. For complex diseases like AMD, no single gene is responsible, but rather multiple genes play a role in combination with lifestyle factors. Identifying these genes can help us understand what causes AMD and how we might treat it. Now let's go through a real example of this process, back to AMD genetics and complement. I mentioned two potential new AMD treatments um, for geographic atrophy at the start of this talk, both of which inhibit the complement pathway. And I said it was genetic insights that provided the motivation to target this. But from an initial list of 20,000 genes, how did AMD genetic studies identify the complement gene specifically? Well, in 2003, the Human Genome Project was completed. For the first time, we had a complete map of the genome. And this crucially meant that we could investigate all, or at least a lot of these genes at once. Now, the Human Genome Project took 13 years and two billion pounds to read the full genome. So, uh, and reading the full genome is called genome sequencing. This wasn't feasible to do for lots of people if you, if you want to run an AMD study. However, genotyping was feasible. And genotyping means you only read selected genetic variants, say 100,000 letters scattered throughout the genome instead of the full 3 billion. And if one of those genetic variants seems interesting, then what you do is you can, you can look at the full genome roadmap check which genes are in the area, and then you can investigate those further. And by an interesting genetic variant, I mean variants that are associated with AMD. So now let's, um, to, to explain that a bit better, let's set up a study. We have a group of people with AMD and a group of people without AMD. So what do we do? We genotype all these people look at all the genetic variants, and the interesting ones are those which are not evenly distributed between the two groups. So for example, if we're looking at one genetic variant and we find that lots of people in the AMD group have a particular version of this, while only a few people without AMD have that version, then it suggests that this genetic variant might be increasing the risk of AMD. This kind of study is called a genome-wide association study. The key point really to take away from all that is 
that it was now possible to study many, many genes across the entire genome all at once. And that's a much faster way of conducting genetic research than picking through 20,000 genes one by one. So 2003, the Human Genome Project's completed. 2005, and we have a landmark genome-wide association study. And this identified a genetic variant in the complement factor H gene that was strongly associated with AMD, a finding that has since been reconfirmed in numerous studies. And this um, particular genetic variant, they reported, um, you know, people with it had up to a sevenfold increased risk of getting AMD. And this was actually a landmark study for genetic research in general, because not only was it the first successful genome-wide association study for AMD, it was actually the first successful study of its kind for any complex genetic disease. Now, this study included 146 people genotyped for 100,000 genetic variants. So that means 100,000 letters per person. As you can imagine, technology only continued to improve. Fast forward to 2016, and we have another landmark study published by the International AMD Genomics Consortium. This study included just under 34,000 participants, each of them genotyped for more than 12 million genetic variants. And now not only is complement factor H associated with AMD, but also complement factors 2, 3, 9, and I. You don't need to remember those, but the point is, by this point, um, the genetic evidence for complement in AMD is pretty strong. As I mentioned earlier, the complement pathway is an inflammatory one, and indeed, lab-based research supports the hypothesis that inflammation mediated by complement plays an important role in AMD. So efforts to try and dampen this inflammation um, may therefore protect us against AMD. And okay, so that is how AMD genetic research led to the development of these potential new complement-based AMD treatments, drugs which are starting now to show some very promising results. How else can genetic research be useful? Well, here are three examples. We can go through more in, um, in questions if we, if we have time. First, Mendelian randomization. This is a clever technique, really, where data from genetic studies is used to simulate a clinical trial. And a clinical trial is where you have people and you, you put them into two groups. One of them gets given an intervention. It, this could be a drug. And the other gets a, a placebo or um, a different drug. So if you want to answer a question like, um, does cholesterol affect my risk of developing AMD? Then you could compare cholesterol levels in people with and without AMD. These studies have been done, actually, finding that HDL cholesterol has an association with AMD. But without running an experiment where you treat HDL cholesterol levels with a drug, it isn't clear whether this would help prevent AMD. Furthermore, to set up an experiment like this would be incredibly difficult. It might take many years of treatment to see any effect, and it just wouldn't really be feasible or even ethical. Now, our genes are with us from birth. So if we're born with a genetic variant that, um, say, raises our HDL cholesterol, well, then that's a little bit like being treated with an HDL cholesterol raising drug our entire lives. Then if you take a genome-wide association study for HDL cholesterol and another for AMD, using Mendelian randomization techniques, you can combine the genetic data to address whether HDL cholesterol actually causes AMD. And this is like a bit like running an expensive clinical trial without, without actually running it. Indeed, a Mendelian randomization study um, has now suggested that raised HDL cholesterol could cause AMD, um, if, especially if it's raised via a specific genetic mechanism. I should, um, before moving on, say that clinical trials are still very much the gold standard. This doesn't replace, replace them, but it's a valuable tool that's allowing us to address important questions um, that 
maybe we couldn't address so well before. Next, predictive medicine. So we can use genetic information to estimate an individual's risk of developing a disease. My grandmother lost her sight from AMD, and I do remember wondering at the time, is this going to happen to me too someday? Um, and, you know, if we know that, if I know what genes I have, and I know that um, some of those are putting me at greater risk of getting AMD in the future, well, maybe then um, I could take early actions to prevent this. And studies have shown that genetic risk predictions can be pretty accurate, but the accuracy still isn't enough for individual testing. And the American Academy of Ophthalmology actually issued a statement recommending avoiding routine ge genetic testing for complex genetic disorders like AMD, for now anyway. Third, pharmacogenetics. This is the study of how someone's genetic makeup affects their response to medications and could one day help answer questions like, how often will I need my AMD injections? Will I experience any side effects? Or will this treatment even work for me? It may be, for example, with some of the new complement-based treatments for AMD that they would be more effective in individuals who actually have certain genetic variants in specific complement genes. And it would be worth knowing that before starting treatment if you could. As with predictive medicine, we're not quite there yet with pharmacogenetic testing for routine AMD care. Um, but these are exciting and very active areas of research that could one day form the foundations for personalized medicine. By that, I mean moving away from a one size fits all approach to treating individuals as, well, individuals with healthcare tailored to their personal needs. So you should watch this space. For the final section of this talk, um, let's discuss where we go from here. What next? There are now over 50 genetic associations with AMD. I focused on the complement story, but a lot more work needs to be done to understand how the other genetic variants contribute to AMD. Altogether, the associations discovered so far are thought to explain about half the genetic risk for AMD. And that's great, but it does also imply that there's another half we don't know about. How can we address this? For a start, bigger studies with more detailed genetic information, sequencing whole genomes instead of genotyping. It now costs a thousand pounds and takes just two days to sequence the full three billion letter genome. And that's much better than 13 years and two billion pounds. Um, but also we need to start piecing together genetic data with the full jigsaw puzzle. If we think a gene is important, then in which part of the eye or, or body even is it active in? Not all genes are equally active in all parts of our bodies. After all, different body parts do very different things. Which are the important downstream proteins? How do our genes interact with environmental exposures like whether we smoke or what we eat? And are there more specific subtypes of AMD than just dry and wet? Specific subtypes that would benefit from specific treatments. Of course, it's not only AMD research that would benefit from larger scale studies. There's now a general movement toward a more uh, sort of modern research format, where instead of only including individuals with a specific condition like AMD, very large numbers of volunteers have a broad range of data collected, including their full medical histories, genetic testing, um, and they are followed up for many years. When you do research like this, it then becomes feasible for many different research teams to examine a range of different health questions and um, con conditions in the same group of people. A prime example of this is the UK Biobank study, which um, some of you may well have heard of. Half a million research volunteers, all genotyped, soon to be whole genome sequenced, with their full medical histories regularly updated from their NHS records, imaging data and more is, is a huge amount of um, information in this, in this project. And studies like this are definitely the way forward. Last year, the UK government 
published the Genome UK statement. And this is a strategy for how the UK will deliver a genomic healthcare system focused on three pillars. Diagnosis and personalized medicine, that's one pillar. Prevention and research. To very briefly outline some headline initiatives, the NHS Genomic Medicine Service, which started last year, will hold genome sequence half a million patients, um, including those with cancer or, or rare diseases, by 2024. The Accelerating Detection of Disease Programme, now called um, Our Future Health, if you were to try and look it up, this aims to genotype 5 million participants. And the ongoing UK Biobank and NIHR bioresource projects will genotype and or whole genome sequence up to 900,000 participants. So these are ambitious and exciting plans. Okay, I'm nearly at the end. So to conclude, these are some take home messages. Genetic research can accelerate drug discovery. The story of complement and AMD is a strong example of this. Mendelian randomization studies capitalize on data from modern genetic studies to address questions that were not feasible to answer with traditional clinical trials. Genetic information could also be used to predict whether an individual will get AMD and how they will respond to treatment. These are active areas of research. And how do we progress from here? Essentially, we need bigger studies, um, more, more research participants, longer follow-up, and more detailed genetic as well as non-genetic information. These are my last couple of slides. Um, I've, I've put on the screen a couple of helpful resources. Um, if you'd like to learn more about genetics and genomic medicine in general, then um, Genomic England's website is a great place to go. And I've also put a link to the government's Genome UK strategy document. Thank you to the Macular Society for inviting me to talk and thank you to my academic mentors and the funding bodies who have supported my own research journey. And of course, thank you all very much for listening. Thanks. Alistair, thank you very much indeed for that. What a fascinating talk. Um, I'm going to ask you to put your camera on again so that we can, yes. so that we can okay. see you. And if anybody has any questions, now is the time to start pumping them into the chat function. Um, and we've got a couple that have, have come in already. Um, but just before we go, well, one, one of them, let's start with one of them actually. Somebody has said, what happened to the 100,000 genome project? Is that still continuing? Well, it, it sounds like it's much bigger than that now. 100,000 genome project, it's now being taken over, overtaken, isn't it? By, um, by these, new, um, these new big investments that we're putting into this area. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so exactly. Um, so um, just on the last, you know, third from the end slide, I mentioned um, uh, the what was it called? The um, what was it called? I've mind blank. Genomics England and yeah. genomic testing in the NHS. So that's that's sort of a continuation of that study essentially. So building on the success of that, they're going to continue, and rather than it just being a study, it's now um, it's now sort of being used in, in routine NHS care. So you don't need to be recruited into it. They're just doing this for um, particularly children with rare conditions and, and cancer patients. So that's that, and it's going up to aim, aiming to, to gene, um, sort of get 500,000 genomes by 2023. Come back, Alistair, if you can. Ah, am I still sharing my screen with you all? No, 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 you're not. No, we're seeing you're uh -huh. not. We're seeing your very handsome face. Um, so, so, I mean, this, this is a, an area now of accelerating interest, isn't it? And accelerating investment, really, from um, uh, governments around the world um, to put money into this. So you, you, you touched on this um, idea of um, uh, how much of the risk of AMD is genetic. And it's, you, you say it's sort of roughly half at the moment. Um, we can identify roughly half the risk of yeah. AMD as being attributable to the genes we now we now know about. But of course, there may be many more that we haven't yet identified. So it's not necessarily the case that only half and everything else is down to smoking and all the rest of it. It could be that there are a lot more genes or genetic influences that we might discover as we do more research. Is that that's basically what you're saying? Yeah, that, that, that's that's right. 
Um, and actually, not just in AMD, but in uh, the, this genetic research of complex genetic disease, common diseases like AMD in general, um, this question of the, the, they call it the missing heritability, is quite a big one, um, as in the studies get bigger and bigger, and we can pick up increasingly more subtle genetic associations. Um, and, and so if we keep increasing the study size, we probably will find more, but I'd it, it doesn't look like, you know, it's a question of, well, we found 50 um, genetic variants that are associated with AMD. If we keep increasing the size, we'll double that and we'll get to 100 and we need to find all 100. It's it's a little bit more um, nuanced than that. And it, it comes down, I think, to now trying to piece it together with, uh, well, the how does that interact with our environment and um, if, whether we smoke and um, which which genes are the ones that are, being um, sort of activated. In fact, um, although I didn't have, I didn't want to muddy the waters by going to it in the talk. One of the biggest challenges with genetic research in AMD and, and others is which are the important genes. So I, I sort of carefully said genetic variants, and I, I mentioned how if you find a variant that's associated with AMD, you can look at the genes nearby, and those are the interesting ones. And it's a little bit more complex in that um, knowing which is the interesting gene is, is actually pretty difficult. Complement is, um, in a way, an unusual example in that um, for AMD, as I pointed out, it wasn't just one complement gene, but multiple complement genes that were found. So that already makes it more likely that it's the complement genes that are important. And then complement's also a protein that we actually know quite a lot about already. Uh, and it had a lot of evidence going for it. Um, for example, the, um, there's uh, a complement disorder which causes kidney disease. And for those patients, quite interestingly, they tend to get drusen, so which, which looks a lot like AMD. Um, so, I mean, the point being, there's a lot of evidence for it anyway. But some of the other genes that are coming out, you know, they, they seem to be in, in areas you might expect, like new vessel growth. So wet AMD, there's bleeding. That's because abnormal new vessels sort of break through and grow and, and bleed in the retina. Um, so that um, lipids, and um, so that's fat, cholesterol. And again, we, we sort of, we think that cholesterol is associated and diet is associated with AMD. So it makes sense, but for those to identify a specific target is a little bit harder. So it has proved to be very difficult because although, as you say, the genes associated with this part of the immune system known as the, the complement system mm. had been a great deal of interest and in an enormous uh, pharmaceutical company, Roche, developed a drug uh, um, in, uh, that was targeting this area of the immune system. And it got through all the clinical trials, got to phase three trials, and then they decided it didn't work. That must have been yeah. an enormous disappointment to people who had such hope that, that you know, this discovery of the complement gene um, implication in AMD was going to produce the result, and very sadly, it didn't. It was, yeah. So that's the um, I think you're referring to the lampilizumab um, drug that was targeting complement factor D. Um, yeah, and I I remember being sort of part of the trial um, when when it was ongoing in in Southampton, and there was so much excitement and expectation that it was going to work. Um, and yes, as you say, unfortunately, it got to the final hurdle, and it didn't quite. Um, so we have to be cautious with, although I, I mentioned two like, really promising um, results that have come out recently, um, you know, they, they still, we're still waiting for the, the final set of, of clinical trials before we know. Um, but that, that lampilizumab trial, complement factor D, was, was actually very interesting in that um, for the early parts of the study, they actually um, genetically tested people for complement. So, um, when I was talking about pharmacogenetic testing and saying it, we're not quite there yet for individuals. So, you know, people who, um, those of you who have injections for wet AMD, for example, there's a lot of research into, can we predict who's going to do really well from their injections or who's going to have a, you know, a, a side effect from it. And we, we don't do that for patients because it's not, it's not accurate enough. But what they found with the lampilizumab study was that, um, it seemed to be showing a good effect in patients with a specific um, mutation in the complement factor I gene. 
And what that did mean was that um, sort of, and what it means for other research studies, if you can, you can use genetic testing like that is, you know, you can't tell that person, oh, you, you're, you're very likely to get AMD or not. But you can at least go, well, this group of people are more likely to progress very quickly to geographic atrophy. Um, and, and then um, essentially, instead of having a, a really massive trial and having to get loads of people for this drug that may not work, as it turned out it didn't, you can say, well, we're expecting it to be effective in just this group. So we'll only collect people with this particular mutation. We don't need quite as many people because we know who we're trying to, to recruit. And, and in that sense, it sort of is also accelerating drug development and, and sort of preventing people from unnecessarily yeah, going through a, a long um, clinical trial. So we're, we're, a lot of our uh, members have been supporting a, um, a trial, a genetic um, therapy um, trial being run by a company called Gyroscope by providing genetic samples. They're looking for a particular genetic um, uh, variant, which only affects about 4% of the population, the AMD population. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a very important group of people to try to target for this particular piece of research. So it, you're, you're right, it doesn't have to affect everybody, does it, to be uh, actually a useful component yes. in the research in the, in the research sort of infrastructure. So um, we've got lots of questions now, so I'm going to shut up and get on with some of these, these questions. Somebody has asked if, we, if you can show your, um, the, your last slide with the two websites, and we'll come back to that later. So if you could prepare that, we'll put that up at the end of the talk, oh, yes. again, so that yeah. people can have a look at those two websites. We'll come back to that. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna take these in the order that they come in actually. So um, it used to be said that people with blue eyes were more at risk of macular degeneration than people with brown eyes. Is there actually any evidence at all that eye colour is affect, is, um, affects somebody's risk? That would be a genetic, a genetic variant, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, genetic variants will, will definitely influence what, what colour your eye is. Um, it's so, um, yeah, so just coming to the color, I suppose, um, I, I don't think there's like hard evidence that, oh, you know, or, or the, you know, if you've got blue eyes, I wouldn't worry hugely is, is the, the point. Don't try and get brown eyes. Um, um, and we, we do think that sort of exposure to UV light might affect AMD, but again, it's not, um, it's not a, like a really strong association. You know, the, the strong, the strong guidance we've give is, you know, things like say smoking, that's, that definitely affects AMD risk. Um, but the other side to the question of blue and brown eyes is, I suppose, um, ethnicity. And that's, that's where the, the waters become quite muddy as well. Um, because different ethnic groups have very different sort of genetic makeup, as you might expect. Um, and um, so, the effect of one genetic variant in, say, Caucasians, it may not may not be quite the same as in Asian people, for example. So, like, while uh, you know here um, as British people, if you get West AMD, you tend to get the, the sort of classic choroidal neovascularization. In Asia, they the West AMD patients have a lot more of a, a different kind of of um, West West AMD. Um, and um, so, so clearly genes are a bit different between the two. And just a, a final point on that is, um, this is, this kind of exposes a, a, a broader problem with genetic research in that um, most of the genetic research has really been performed only in Caucasian populations. Um, and, and that's, that's partly because um, you know, it's, it's actually quite difficult to get meaningful results if you just combine people from dis different ancestries. If you try and do a genetic study with people from all over the world all lumped together, what you might just find is you're finding the genes that um, tell you whether, you know, which country someone came from rather than the disease you're interested in. Um, but say with um, predicting, um, using genetic information to predict is someone going to get AMD, it really needs a big push to include a lot, a much sort of wider ethnic background for that to become useful, and that's partly the um, the thinking behind things like the um, you know our future health, the accelerating detection of diseases program I mentioned. You, you just need massive numbers, and you you need to try and be as inclusive as possible if if these things are ever going to take off and be useful. That's really interesting. Some, somebody's asked about whether any work has been done with twins. Uh, in, in AMD. Yeah, so that, 
that number um, of, um, um, so what is the, we say heritability of AMD um, is, is quoted as between about 45 and 70%. That comes from sort of looking at twins. So uh, for, it sounds like whoever asked that question um, knows a bit about the genetics, but for others, twins can be identical or non-identical. And if you compare groups of non-identical and, and identical twins, you can start to kind of um, tease out like, well, how much of this disease seems to be from genes alone, like the identical twins you'd expect would be very similar, and how much is due to the environment they were brought up in. So the, the non-identical twins um, will be very similar, usually in, in most respects, brought up in the same household and same diet and so on, but but their genes will be somewhat different. So yeah, uh, but that, that really is, um, to my knowledge, the um, the main area with twins research and um, making studies with twins or families, um, which is where genetic research in MD was before the Human Genome Project, um, is is good. But the problem with that is it's, it's kind of it's quite hard to get the numbers you need to start teasing out these more subtle effects. So once you could start doing genome-wide association studies, where you just get groups of unrelated people, you just get anyone with AMD, anyone without AMD, sort of, then, then you can get massive numbers, like I, I mentioned, and, and that's when you start to get the power to really sort of drill down into the, the finer details. So quite a few people on the, on the chat are raising this issue of <clears throat> um, having um, children, um, or, you know, if they, if they, if they're one of, the, a parent of theirs had macular degeneration, they have it, um, they're worried about their families, their, their children, the next generation. And th this could be a great source of concern and, and worry to people, really. Mm. Um, and it, it's difficult to know, because of everything you, you've told us, this is not a directly hereditary condition, is it? It's much more complicated than that. But what, how, do you, how do you think people can best manage this situation and, and explain this to, to families? Should they actually overtly warn them, I've got it, your grandpa had it, um, you know, you need to adjust, you know, give up smoking. That would be a really good thing to advise somebody, wouldn't it, if they were doing that. But to what extent should people worry and, th and their children be alarmed by, by this, do you think? It's a delicate area, this, isn't it? It's a very difficult area for people. Yes. Um... Um, I mean, so, so facts wise, if, if, if you have a first degree relative, so like a, a brother, a, a mother or, or so on with, with AMD, then your risk compared to someone who, who isn't in that situation is something like two or three, you're two or three times like more likely to get AMD yourself. So I guess, um, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I should say you're still more likely to not get AMD, so I, I wouldn't worry unduly. And as I said, um, and as many of you will know, it tends to be a, a slowly progressing thing. It's you know you don't see any signs of it until um, sort of in in later life, really. And um, what what should you do? Well, enjoy life, and and then. Uh, the fact that you're aware means that you can take some simple actions and maybe even after all this research those will be the most important like having a healthy diet definitely don't smoke um <clears throat> i think we'll just keep saying that over and over don't smoke it's it's really such a big risk factor for this um and um i suppose if you're aware of amd you're, you're more likely to know that well if i notice something with my vision then just go and get it checked out you know even just go to the optician and, and see and get have a look at what's going on. One, one thing I would say from um, clinical experience is um, what sometimes happens for those people who, who aren't so familiar with conditions like macular degeneration is they will they'll develop it in one eye, and because the other eye is so good, they don't know uh, they don't sort of notice that anything's happened. And um, you know it may not be macular degeneration; it can be other things like cataract. Um, but cataract is fixable, and AMD obviously, if you leave it too long especially for the wet one where we have a very good treatment available it's it's sort of a shame so it's worth checking your eyes individually um every now and then um for for um, people who, who wonder how can i protect myself um, um sorry yeah no carry on 
No, no, no. Um, so, was... so, so you're right. So the thing is to avoid the things that you can avoid. If you know that you've got a family history of this, avoid the things that you know that you can avoid. Smoking, I think the, the last, um, uh, every 10 years, the Surgeon General of the United States issues um, a, a sort of edict on smoking. I think the last one said that there is now enough evidence to, um, to, to um, claim a causal risk between smoking and macular degeneration. And we know that smokers are three to four times more likely than non-smokers to develop AMD. But if you've got a certain genetic profile, then you know smoking on top of those genes um, is going to be uh, raising your risk very considerably. Um, a healthy diet, and we talk about that in terms of a diet high in antioxidants, don't we? Yes. Um, uh, lots of green leafy vegetables, lutein, zeaxanthin, lots of vitamin C, vitamin, uh, vitamin E, vitamin D, and so on. Um, uh, and supplementation, if you can't be sure of getting that, um, that sort of diet. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, no direct evidence, really strong evidence that supplementation can prevent it from uh, uh, occurring uh, and yeah. or turning the, turning the disease process back again is basically it. Um, That's right. Yeah. So um, uh, another another question here, which is that a few um, journals on um, uh, other gene therapy treated diseases and AMD. I, I think this is a question about are there other diseases or conditions that you see frequently alongside AMD? So could there be genes that are causing multiple conditions? I guess I think is the question here. Um, yeah, I mean, not not that springs to mind. Um, so, for example, the other big um, condition that fills our clinics is diabetes and diabetic macular edema and that's that's treated with um, the same treatments as we give the West AMD patients really um, so so it was you know I've, I've been looking myself into the the literature is uh, if, if you have AMD are you more likely to have diabetic macular edema or if you have diabetic macular edema are you more likely to get AMD and it's it's not very clear basically some studies say yes some say no, but I, I don't think I don't think there's any that um, yeah there there aren't any like diseases that are definitely going alongside it um, that I'm aware of. Um, I think we have um, a hand raised. Bonnie Bonnie has raised a hand. So Bonnie, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Can you unmute yourself, Bonnie? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> All right. Well, if if you can, Bonnie, uh, just interrupt me in a, in a minute. Then we'll come back. We'll come back to you. Um, um, uh, you you touched on this, but just could we just return to clarify a little bit about the thinking about exposure to sunlight uh, as an environmental risk factor? Is there evidence of of that? You mentioned that in passing. Yes. Um, yeah. The, there is some evidence, just not hugely strong. Um, so. I think it's it's a little bit of a um, you know it, it makes sense to try and limit your sun sunlight exposure you know wear sunglasses uh, be sensible in in that sort of way but um, you know going on holiday to sunny places is you know not not prohibited. <laughs> No, no. Um, and and several people are asking about um, trials and how to get involved in in trials. Um, yes. So what I mean. Uh, uh, the Macular Society has a trial participant database. So if you are interested in taking part in trials, you can register to get onto our database. And we will then let you know if there is a trial in your area that might be suitable for you to join. Um, uh, but Al Alistair, what are the other uh, routes to finding out what trials are going on and how to? Yeah, so I mean, the, um, I just came, I was just looking up, I recently came across this website called um, bepartofresearch.nihr.ac.uk so that's bepartofresearch.nihr.ac.uk um, and that that seems to also be a, a really good place for for you to go and it's it's quite a nice design you, you can just put in your postcode and then um, you can look up what are the the research projects near me, or you can look up what are the conditions that are actually being researched. So you can, you know, you can hone in on eyes and eye research quite easily. Um, but the other way is, of course, to, you know, um, talk to your 
I guess the first thing is to talk to your ophthalmologist if you're going to an ophthalmology clinic um, and, and see what, what's sort of um, recruiting locally. I can't say that I, I know of any, um, particularly for AMD genetic research, um, you know, that I could um, sort of highlight to you, but those are the ways to keep your ear to the ground and, and listen out. And I, I suppose the other, the other big moment you talk with our future health um, and, you know, once upon a time you had to actively um, a volunteer for, for example, the 100,000 genome project, but this sort of information is now being collected um, almost automatically, isn't it? Patients, patient information now, and the the value is being really driven home of how we as patients ourselves are sitting on this enormously valuable research resource, uh, which is to say, ourselves, our own information, our own data, um, is now such an enormous part of medical research, isn't it? And 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 in fact, you know, if you say, well, how can I contribute to research? Well, you are just being yourself and sharing yourself with the research community is such an important part, isn't it now? Yes. Um, so with that, um, say the the um, our future health initiative, I think the 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 aim is to try and recruit people um, from GP health checks. And, and of course, you know, you talked about preventing AMD and um, we talked just before this about, um, you know, how we need more research into before people get AMD, um, because what we want is to stop people getting it, not not wait till we've you know already got it, and then try and and sort of um, make that situation a bit less bad. Um, but um, I think it's it's important to also say that we we all very much have a choice to take part in genetic research. I'd encourage people to yes be be a part of it because it, it stands to benefit us all. Um, but it is the choice and it's always consent that's given and all these studies like the UK Biobank, uh, you know, patients give broad consent to say yes, pretty much here's all my medical history that can be used for research purposes, but they're also free to withdraw that at any point and, um, you know, that's, that's a personal decision and one that should be respected. And a lot, a big part of moving forward, and, and it's talked, it's sort of discussed in the Genome UK strategy document, is um, you know, people, the public, and and well, all of us need to be engaged in what's happening, and to sort of be reassured that our data isn't just being used without us knowing about it, and that it is actually being used to put, you know, for good use, and that governments think about things like well. If our genetic research as a nation from the NHS is being used to say develop the next um, big wonder drug for AMD, and a company gets really rich from that, is that going to filter back to us other than just having a you know a, a drug that we can pay for with our taxes? So, so these are important ethical questions that I didn't want to sort of dwell on um, for the purpose of a research talk, but they are important. They, they, they are indeed, they are indeed, and of course, you know, we know from fake news and conspiracy theories and so on that there's been an awful lot of, um, around COVID, hasn't there, concern about, you know, there being some kind of genetic manipulation, for example, the, on the vaccines and, and things mm -hmm. like that. It, it's very easy for people to get um, anxious and misled about, about yeah. this stuff, but equally it is utterly important, therefore, that the data is dealt with ethically and uh and safely because people you know it is our it is us isn't it it's yep. it's, a, it's ours um so what what would be your kind of dream scenario then for this where 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 is this going to lead ultimately do you think what do you you really hope for the future for this well, well um i guess in the immediate i I hope that um, those, at least one of those drugs uh, that I mentioned for geographic atrophy works because that would be a huge breakthrough for um, AMD. You know, up until now, we, we really just have, well, I say just, they're good, but you know, we, we don't have a treatment like for wet AMD. We, we've got the vitamins and, and don't smoke, but not, not a treatment. But um, I think where it would be really fantastic is to, um, if we can prevent people from getting AMD, in the first place, and and maybe that doesn't have to be drugs. Even if if we can show more clearly that, for example, you know just how beneficial it is to have a healthy diet. You know, maybe if if we can show well, if this is how you eat and this is how much it's going to protect you a lot, say against AMD, then that kind of public health message 
is going to be just as good, valuable, if not more valuable, than any sort of fancy drug that comes out of this. So I guess dream scenario, I think um, understanding AMD and then moving to a sort of more personalized area where, you know, like, um, yeah, we can, for those people who are worried, is my daughter going to get AMD or am I going to get AMD? We can sort of answer that a bit more clearly and um, and and actually do something about it because, as I said, we do have, a, there are some tests that can be bought for AMD, but um, well, one, they're not that accurate, um, but two, e even if even if they were accurate, there's not a huge amount we can say for sure that you should be doing about it other than things you should do anyway, don't smoke and, and so on. Yes, we know, we know that the environmental risk factors for AMD are pretty the same as they are for heart disease, for example, aren't they? Yes. You know, so the mitigation is the same. Don't smoke, have a healthy diet, don't have high blood pressure, um, yeah. take some exercise, you know, all it's all the same advice. Uh, sounds sounds so, boring, but it's but it's good advice nonetheless. <laughs> it's good advice nonetheless. Okay, well, um, Alistair, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I'm so very grateful to you for uh, giving up your evening for us, and thank you very much indeed for an absolutely riveting and fascinating talk. So, um, if we didn't get around to your question, I'm sorry. You will, uh, you may discover it if you listen again and, wa and watch again. So, we'll be um, posting this up on our website uh, in uh, in a day or two. Uh, so if you know somebody who would like to have watched it but couldn't, then please do pass on the details of how they can do so. Um, uh, Alistair, thank you very much indeed. We will be back again next month uh, uh, on the third Tuesday of the month. So it will be, I think, the six, I think it might even be the 16th again um, uh, of March. And my guest on that occasion will be a consultant ophthalmologist from Leeds, Martin McKibben. And Martin is leading on a big project in the NHS called the uh, AMD uh, National Ophthalmology uh, Database Audit. Now, uh, it might sound a, a bit uh, dull, this, but actually it's a very interesting way of working out where the best practice in the NHS is. Uh, this is looking across uh, AMD clinics across the country to look at the deviation and the variation in treatment and treatment outcomes um, and the, uh, from that variation. So this is an opportunity for you uh, to hear about the audit, but also to give uh, a very senior clinician in the uh, NHS your views on what works well in AMD clinics and what doesn't work well in AMD treatment uh, and how to improve it. So please do join us again next month on the 16th of March, the usual time, seven o'clock. Uh, submit your questions in advance if you'd like to. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much indeed to everybody for joining us, 120 odd people on the call uh, uh, to this evening. So it's great to see you all and I hope that uh, we'll see you again next month. Alistair, meanwhile, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, good you. night everybody and we'll see you soon. Thank you.